central massif of the Himalayas presides over the landscape of Nepal, a constant presence which also occupies the majority of its territory. The white peaks have always attracted men who consider them first as deities, then as challenges. But further down, the secret forests of this part of the world conceal the most ancient of all legends. The human settlers of these valleys have had to find ways to survive on these sheer slopes. Along the slopes, they have created a safe place in which to grow their crops away from the wild beasts of the valley floor. Their terraced fields look directly over the forest below, a superb vantage point from which to survey the jungle of the unicorn. In 398 BC, the Greek historian Cetesius wrote a book about Indian Nepal, and for the first time spoke of a wild beast which, to this day, continues to fascinate mankind. The inhabitants of the forest knew of its presence, and in the shadows of the humid jungle its smell still lingers. The legend lives here. The magical creature with a single horn spoken of in countless cultures, emerging from the mists of time, the most sought-after mystery. But this animal has long been cursed, and time has not changed that. In the 21st century, it is still hunted for the power that grows on its forehead. We are going to enter the enchanted forest, the birthplace of the legend. On the tracks of the unicorn. Along the border between Nepal and India, there runs a strip of rainforests which alternate with the meadows of the lowlands. Open jungle whose floor or rich in pasture provides food for many species of herbivores. After Africa, these forests possess the greatest variety of animal species in the world. And nonetheless, due to their inaccessibility, they remain virtually unknown. Large deer, such as the Sambas, are the food of the king of the shadows. The presence of the Bengal tiger means the herbivores of the jungle must constantly be on the alert. Danger is ever-present. The pattern of the skin of this great feline forms part of the landscape as it hunts for the meat it needs to maintain its almost 300 kilos of striped body. But the tiger is not the only giant of these forests. On the intense green ground there is an animal which not even he would dare to attack. the gore. Weighing 1,000 kilos, it is the largest wild bovine in the world. A ton of bad temper standing up to two meters tall. The gores not only have nothing to fear from the tigers, but will even trample them down if one crosses the path of the herd. A less violent way to escape from the tiger is to climb up into the higher levels of the jungle. Mm -hmm. 
This is precisely what the Langurs do. In India, these animals are sacred as in their religion they are related to the monkey god, Hanuman. These primates are exclusively vegetarian, specialized in the consumption of leaves. Such a poor diet that they are forced to be constantly on the move across the roof of the jungle in search of a decent tree. More nutritious than leaves are these large flowers on which the hummingbirds feed. These birds are experts at extracting the sweet nectar contained inside the corollas along with the tiny insects that seek refuge there. Their constant visits carry the pollen from one flower to another, pollinating them and so contributing to keeping the forest alive. All these biological marvels were already here 2,000 years ago when the first travelers spoke of this land as a magical place inhabited by fantastic creatures, above all one in particular, the unicorn. Its horn, which they called an alicornis, was a sure antidote to any poison which it immediately detected and neutralized. This made it greatly desired by kings and noblemen, always afraid of being poisoned. Some of them offered vast fortunes in exchange for one. Romans and Greeks spread the myth and thanks to a translation by Luther, it entered the Bible itself where it is quoted seven times. The Roman Elianus speaks of the Cartazon, a term taken from the Sanskrit Cartagian, which means Lord of the Jungle, and Pliny the Elder calls it Monoceros, with the head of a deer, the feet of an elephant, and the tail of a pig. But without a doubt, the most important description was that of the Roman Julius Solinus, who defines it as a monster with a terrible roar and a horn springing from the center of its forehead of marvelous splendor, four feet in length, and which can never be caught alive. The chronicler's description was not far from reality. The myth lives here, and it is the Indian rhinoceros. Its means of defense was in fact imported into Europe until the end of the 18th century as unicorn horns, to be used as remedies for a wide range of illnesses, and this belief still continues in traditional Asian medicine. Its leathery skin was also used for defense by men in the form of shields for the soldiers. This armor plating protects them from attacks by tigers. The fact that man coveted certain parts of its body brought the Indian rhinoceros to the verge of extinction, and by 1960, barely a hundred remained. The massacre did not cease until 1976, when a division of the Nepalese army was given the task of protecting them from attacks by poachers. These characteristic jungles are crossed by major rivers which, in the rainy season, overflow, forming extensive floodplains. The climate is subtropical, with the summer monsoon accounting for 90% of the annual rainfall. When the monsoon arrives, the vegetation literally explodes, covering everything. The flooded plains fill with elephant grasses, so-called because of their size as they grow up to 8 meters high. It is an ideal ecosystem for plant eaters, the many different species that feed on grasses which occupy and colonize it, forming an intricate tapestry. The incredible exuberance of the vegetation is hell for man, but not for the plant eaters who gorge themselves on the gigantic feast that covers everything.
At this time of year, the rhinoceroses and a number of species of deer, such as the sambas and the chital, spend many hours here. Just a few hundred years ago, the Indian rhinoceros grazed on all the floodplains of the Indus, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, but now it has been reduced to just two national parks, Chitwan in Nepal and Kasiranga in India. This region called Terai forms the northern border between India and Nepal and is occupied by ecosystems characteristic of the salt forests and grasslands flooded by seasonal rises in water levels. These are the lands of the Indian rhinoceros, the final refuges of the unicorn. Here in the Kasiranga National Park, the river Brahmaputra floods over every year, fertilizing the entire plain with silt so rich that the vegetation is among the most exuberant, the variety of species among the greatest in the world. Three quarters of the park is then flooded, and when the waters retreat, innumerable swamps and marshes called mihils remain. This is when this wildlife paradise really comes alive. Seventy percent of the world population of Indian rhinoceroses live here. For them and for the Asian elephants, water provides a refuge from the heat and a place in which their enormous body weight is a little easier to bear. In 1985, this park was declared a World Heritage Site, and to preserve this treasure, the Indian government put into action one of the greatest conservationist initiatives in the world. In Kasiranga, there is one guard for every square kilometer. Another of the treasures of these jungles is the only animal capable of taking advantage of the meat of herbivores as large as the great buffaloes. It is also hunted by the poachers, but its major concern is finding enough to eat. The presence of the tiger is the cause of one of the greatest problems, the coexistence of the national parks and the people who live close by them. In the country as a whole, at least 50 people die every year from tiger attacks. Between three and five in Chitwan alone, almost always due to imprudence on the part of the victims. But the tiger avoids humans whenever it can. It would rather risk its life trying to bring down an enormous buffalo. This one has been badly injured in a fight with one of the great striped felines. Its hindquarters, its back and its face have been clawed and bitten, and it has lost an eye. With humidity of around 90%, the wounds will not easily heal, and internal infections will kill it. Separated from the herd, all it can do is wait for the tiger to return and finish off the job. Now it is easier to understand the function of the armor-plated skin of the rhinoceros. You can eat in peace if you have that kind of protection from possible attackers. But our unicorns have a taste for the high grasses of the banks of the swamp, and both in Kasiranga and here in Chitwan, these grasses are also a valuable resource for the human populations living around the edge of the park. Since 1973, when it was declared a national park due to the fact it was the only place in Nepal where rhinoceroses remained, a number of human settlements have been moved. 
The people transferred to more fertile places without wild herbivores. However, 310 villages have not been able to be relocated and they remain in direct contact with the park. When the season arrives, the local inhabitants cross the river and enter the reserves armed with their recently sharpened sickles. Here they find what they're looking for. The natives have a legal concession to harvest the high grasses each year. Around 60,000 people gather almost 11,000 tons during harvest time, which lasts for 15 days or so. The bushels accumulate, reaching a market value of some $450,000. After taking off the costs of permits and labor, the net contribution to the local economy is around $250,000. As well as the income from sales to the paper industry, the grasses are also a basic construction material for these people. They are also used to feed the domestic cattle, which cannot stray far in search of pasture, for fear of being attacked by tigers. The heavy monsoon rains make constant repairs to the roofs necessary. This is also done with dried grass. Wherever in the world there are people living in a subsistence economy, we only need to see what the roofs are made of to know what is the most accessible, cheap local material. Underground water, clean and healthy, is fortunately abundant. And from this and the soil, the women make adobe, which of course also includes grass among its ingredients. But not all land uses are as uncontroversial as the harvesting of elephant grass. Wheat and cotton fields are slowly replacing stretches of jungle. Here, man is constantly present, carrying out the different tasks in the course of the year. And this creates problems with the local wildlife. These towers, called machams, are watchtowers from which to spot wild animals. There is always a lookout on duty, ready to raise the alarm whenever a tiger or a rhinoceros enters the fields, posing a threat to the workers' lives. In reality, all the animals are doing is returning to places that were always theirs, but which little by little have been stolen from them by man, who knows how to turn to his advantage the greatest enemy of the jungle. But the rainforests of Asia are almost as old as fire itself. They have tremendous powers of regeneration, the ancient strength of vegetation. Certain species are invulnerable to fire. They do not burn, they simply resist. The Semul trees are fireproof and they are therefore the final refuge in the jungle. Chitwan means the heart of the jungle. And once more in this part of the world, legend and reality go hand in hand.
The fact that certain species burn and others don't favors the growth of the so-called secondary forest, different from the original jungle, clearer and with more light, in which grass is able to grow on the ground. It is the perfect place for the ungulates, a paradise for deer who here form herds unlike their solitary relatives in the primary forests. The ancient inhabitants of the primitive jungle are forced to climb up ever higher in search of food. This is also home to a bird which for 3,000 years now has been an aesthetic symbol for man. This is the land of the peacock, the place in which evolution created such a strange creature. It is the national bird of India, sacred for Hindus and Buddhists alike, the destroyer of snakes and, according to Poppy belief, capable of hypnotizing them. The characteristic territorial cry of the males warns rivals that this territory is occupied. Then the suitor displays his feathers, one meter sixty centimeters long, in the hope of sufficiently impressing one of these visiting females that she will agree to be the mother of his chicks. The females prefer the males with most peacock eyes, and these continue to grow throughout their lifetime. So the older the male, the larger his tail, and the more females he is able to attract. Such a flamboyant display in the middle of a jungle full of tigers is a risky business, but in nature, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And what is more, the more superbly decorated the males, the less they participate in rearing the chicks. See you around sometime, honey. The langurs, however, like the good primates they are, do have a long, close family life. The baby langurs spend a lot of time playing and learning from the adults the tricks of life up in the treetops. On the ground or up in the highest branches, the little ones jump and wave their arms, developing their binocular vision, which gives them extraordinary spatial balance. In their young brains, the neuronal connections are established which some day will save their lives when they have to flee from danger swinging from branch to branch. The jungle floor is where the organic material collects and the microorganisms and invertebrates that feed on it. Simian societies can be just as complex as ours, but when it comes to organization, none is as perfect as this one, the termites. The termites do not form the bulk of their diet, but for older langurs, they are like spicy chili peppers, an amusing snack that breaks the monotony of all that leaf salad. Just stick your finger in and suck. There are so many species of termite in these jungles that no one knows the precise number. 
Their fortresses are intelligent buildings with their own air conditioning. But this doesn't prevent them from being constantly attacked. These are sloth bears. Their characteristic thick, long lips are designed to literally suck up the termites from their holes. Their sight is poor, their smell worse, and they are renowned for their bad temper. They are among the strangest bears in the world, and local stories speak of them as fierce beasts. The last jungles in Asia still contain so many mysteries that not a year goes by without it being discovered that an ancient legend really exists, or that a mythical animal has always lived here. But the myths spoken of in ancient travelers' tales are now up against a formidable enemy, a human population that is constantly growing. Like this giant boar, man and the great jungle stand looking each other in the face, not knowing what to do, unsure who will take the first step. At any moment, mutual respect may turn into aggression. And what will happen to the unicorn then? India contains 16% of the world's population on just 2% of the land surface. But the tradition of creating forest and nature reserves dates from the 4th century BC. For the time being, Chitwan and Kasiranga are a good home for the rhinoceroses, with around 400 in the Nepalese park and 1,200 in the Indian one as well as other small groups scattered across another six areas. The total population estimated by the World Wildlife Fund in February 2000 is just 2,095 animals on the entire planet. Weighing almost 2,000 kilos and weighing 4.2 meters in length, it needs up to 5 square kilometers to cover its territorial and dietary needs. Its constant movements among the grass create an entire network of tracks which other animals take advantage of. It's hard to believe that such a formidable animal almost disappeared forever as the result of false, ridiculous, magical and medicinal beliefs and what is more, beliefs held by people living far away from these animals' homeland. The Indian rhinoceros deposits its feces, creating over the years large piles which act as olfactory markers or beacons, defining its territory. Gigantic dung heaps that are impossible to ignore, even for the least sensitive nose. Rhinoceroses are essentially solitary animals, but when the males reach sexual maturity at 10 years of age, they fight even the females when they meet. During these rare encounters, even the elephants prefer to leave them to it. Scenes like this represent, like few others, the essence of the wild paradise of this part of the world. Contrary to popular belief, they do not use their famous horn as a weapon, but rather bite at their rival. The loser will move off to try his luck elsewhere.
Another of the paradoxes of the ancient unicorn is that its horn is not the part of its body the Nepalese most appreciate. They come to the dung heaps in search of what they swear is an infallible remedy for coughs. When you get home, nothing better than making yourself comfortable and enjoying one of the most highly prized products of the land. All you have to do is to spread out a piece of paper and sprinkle a little rhino dung on it. With care and patience, you achieve just the right texture to mix it with tobacco according to taste. An exquisite cigarette containing the most select feces in the region. For them, the enormous piles of dung are a plentiful supply of the ingredients for the finest tobacco. Without a doubt, an exclusive luxury that only a few can enjoy. The taste of a legend would surely be a fitting advertising slogan. Oblivious of man's obsession with his feces, the Indian rhinoceros has changed very little in the last million years. As they are basically unsociable, the typical group of rhinoceroses is this, a female with her child. A vegetarian diet is lacking in a number of nutrients, which the rhinoceroses have to obtain from other sources. In certain places in the jungle, the soil is rich in mineral salts and trace elements, and so the mothers take their children there from when they are very young. They memorize the location, and so the knowledge of these secret places is passed down from one generation of rhinos to the next. They literally eat the soil. The little one will not forget the lesson. No one in the jungle would dare disturb a female rhinoceros with her young. Their ferocity and courage are almost as legendary as their horns. But rhinoceroses like to spend many hours in places also much appreciated by man. For the rhinoceros, as for many other species of animal in this part of the world, water means a cool retreat and a place to find food. In their river valleys and in all the low regions which are periodically flooded, these swamps are formed, covering immense areas along the banks of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. Rhinoceroses are perfectly content, half submerged in their very own vegetable soup, from which they eat while placing virtually no stress on their backbone, which most of the time has to carry the enormous weight of the animal. This tendency for very heavy mammals to submerge themselves in water and so compensate for their weight was precisely what led some of them to return to the sea many millions of years ago, giving rise to the cestaceans. What cannot be denied is that rhinoceroses swim well and with evident satisfaction. As they constantly move in and out of the water, these giants open up the vegetation, stirring up the mud at the banks. In this way, they keep the water surfaces clear, preventing the plants from covering them entirely. Without rhinoceroses and elephants, 
there would be much less open, available water, and the number of bird species in the region would be considerably reduced. Beaks. Some very still, others in constant movement. The soup, which is vegetable for the rhinoceros, becomes fish soup for the majority of the birds, such as this Asian stork. Or this heron, which prefers more decisive movements. Long legs and eyes looking down into the pool. Here, each one makes use of what evolution has equipped them with to catch prey of different sizes. This male Asian jabiru is also a type of stork, and like all others in the family, is not adverse to scavenging when carrion is around, in this case the dead body of a coot. But neither its legs nor its beak are adapted to feeding on meat and it'll have serious problems digesting something so large. Each animal has its own techniques. This is Ananinga, a type of long-necked cormorant, and it has a little problem. It seems to be offering its catch to the sun, but in fact it is warming up after fishing because its plumage is not completely impermeable. This makes it easier to dive down and swim beneath the surface, but it gets very wet and, from time to time, it has to dry out. And here we have the result. It was worth the dip, even if its body is now dripping wet. But its triumphal march arouses the lowest instincts of the opportunists. The Aninga tries to reach a safe place in order to eat its catch before anyone feels tempted to snatch it from him. It is hardly elegant as it emerges from the water, and its problems are not over yet. The fish is stuck, and it will have to gobble it down, scales and all. All this movement by the Aninga alerts the most dangerous mouth in these waters. The marsh crocodile can be found throughout much of the Indian subcontinent. Over four meters in length, it shelters in holes and eats birds. more than reason enough to make a quick exit when you hear one entering the water. This enormous snout belongs to a close relative of the crocodile and an expert fisher. The gavial can reach up to six and a half meters in length and is a zoological treasure that lives only in this part of the world. is said to accompany the dead on their last journey along the sacred rivers of India. The shallow water courses are also the scene of hundreds of small dramas which often go unnoticed. These two toads of the Bufo genus are engaged in amorous activities, but they are being spied on by a very dangerous onlooker. A water snake like this one knows how to choose precisely the right moment. As it approaches, its forked tongue transfers the smells of the river to the olfactory receptors on its head. The slippery lovers add their body fluids to the water without suspecting this could be the last thing they ever do. The moment has arrived. Slithering along, the snake approaches, but the female toad who is on the bottom has seen it. 
Such sudden agility surprises the snake, and not the male toad who gets on with a job not suspecting his girlfriend is saving his life. Mounting another animal is also recommendable on more peaceful occasions. Tourists riding on elephants. The national parks of Chituan and Kaziranga can be visited by anyone willing to sit atop the king of the jungle emulating Hannibal himself. Since at least 2000 BC, elephants have been tamed and trained by man for construction, transport and war. Now, 4000 years later, there is still no more comfortable, safe and cheap means of transport on which to explore the jungles of the unicorn. Up here, the visitors are safe from tigers and have a superb view of their surroundings. And thanks to this new ecotourism, the ancient tradition of the mahouts, the carers and drivers of these pachyderms is being preserved precisely at the time when traditional uses are in decline. These men and their animals form close, lifelong bonds from the time the elephant is very young. In this way, traveling around on the back of an elephant has become a new source of income for the local population. And this benefits not only the rhinoceros and the tiger, but the elephant itself, along with the ancient tradition of training them. They are not noisy, do not contaminate, and when they stop working, they can be recycled. And what is more important, the other inhabitants of the jungle are used to their presence, and so they do not frighten or disturb them. Precisely because of these advantages, men in the past used them to hunt down the rhinos. But as in many parts of the world, the Indians and Nepalese have realized that a live rhinoceros brings much more income than a dead one. A good trophy satisfies just a single hunter, while a live specimen can attract hundreds of amateur photographers. For the short-sighted unicorn, this is simply an elephant with something strange on its back, maybe parasites, but in any case, totally inoffensive. Thanks to the elephant, we have been able to enter the world of the unicorn. A world whose nightmares have not changed much despite the passing of time. The belief in the supposed medicinal powers of the rhinoceros horn still remains in traditional Asian medicine, and so illegal trading can generate enormous profits. In Bangkok, a kilo of Indian rhinoceros horn costs over $16,000. And in a region where poverty is rife, the temptation to poach is enormous. 
The magic horn which made it a legend almost led it to join the dinosaurs, the dodo and the mammoth in the book of extinct species. But these people are saving them. New generations of visitors who come here not to kill, but simply as a break from routine. Curious travelers willing to pay to catch a glimpse of a legend. A small army that comes in peace and sleeps, eats, drinks and buys souvenirs here, thereby repaying the local population for their efforts to preserve the nature of their land. 26 years ago, Chitwan received fewer than 1,000 visitors. Today, over 100,000 come every year. 50% of the income generated by the park is used for the development of the human settlements around it, and people are encouraged to actively participate in conservation, training as wardens, guides, maintenance and catering staff. The charges for entering and camping in the park, the price of elephant tours and lodging and permits, generate increasing income, making the local people more and more convinced that they are fortunate in having a national park on their doorstep. The informed visitor eagerly seeks out the most characteristic, distinguishing cultural traits of each region, appreciating not only nature, but also local customs and folklore. The crackle of a campfire in the forests of Asia is still something that many are willing to pay for. Perhaps it was all true. Perhaps this is the magic of the unicorn. Night is drawing in around the Himalayas. Mist descends over the jungle where the last Indian rhinoceroses live. The adult female and her child, who brings hope for the species, are heading into the thick of the jungle to spend the night. And another warden comes on duty. For some, a green hell, for others, the mythological forest inhabited by celestial creatures and unicorns, a place which holds an incredible fascination for all. When the sun goes down, the sounds change, the spirits of the night awake to wander in the moonlight. That is how the legend was born. With the translucent wings of the bats, perhaps under the effects of a fever, but it was here by the Brahmaputra. It was all true. This is the home of an incredible animal with a single horn emerging from its forehead, which can cure all the evils of the poor peoples with whom it shares this land. Being capable of attracting people from all over the world simply in the hope of seeing it. The legend did not lie. The unicorn exists. <laughs> <laughs>